Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Founder Hour. I'm your co-host, Pat. And before we get into today's amazing episode, just a quick reminder to please subscribe on iTunes and give us a rating and review to help more people discover the show. Also subscribe to our weekly email newsletter for updates, inspiration, exclusive content, and more by visiting thefounderhour.com and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, at The Founder Hour. Today's conversation is with Chip Wilson, founder of Lululemon. It's a jam-packed episode where we discuss everything from Chip's younger years all the way up to starting Lululemon and what he's been up to since leaving the company in 2015. He also shares some timely advice for entrepreneurs who are currently in business or looking to start their own, the mistakes he's made throughout his incredible founder journey and what he's most proud of, and what he sees as the biggest opportunity in the next five to 10 years. Let's jump right in. We started off the conversation by learning a bit about Chip's childhood. Uh, basically a California boy, San Diego. Um, but, uh, my dad was from, uh, Canada. Uh, my parents had met in university down in BYU, the only two non Mormons in the place. And, um, they, mom immediately got pregnant and, uh, and, uh, anyway, kind of spent that five years in San Diego, just, um, uh, getting finished. My dad finished his degree and we ended up moving back to Calgary in Canada. And then every summer, I would get shipped back to San Diego to hang out with my grandparents, <clears throat> which is great because I really got to see the forest through the trees about how California was changing, especially the surf skate culture. And um, uh, But, you know, starting around the age of about eight, I got into competitive swimming, and I think that dictated my life uh, from a point of, you know, hard work equals results, uh, goal setting, um, athletics, uh, and then um, just, you know, any kind of, uh, I felt so comfortable in the water and, and in a Speedo, it made a lot of other athletic clothing that I uh, encountered in my life really uncomfortable. Um, kind of went through school. I was, I, I skipped grade two, but then became a very good C student from there on right till grade 12. And um, I went off to university with a, um, uh, and in order to get a university, then you needed a 60% average. And I had a 61% average with a 98 in phys ed. So it kind of tells you what the rest of my marks were like. I spent two years in university and um, headed off to work on the Alaska oil pipeline, which was a, a real stroke of luck. And in about a year and a half, I made about $750,000 in today's dollars. And uh, so I came back as a 19 year old and, uh, and another fortunate thing happened to me, whether you, you want to hear it that way or not, but my parents divorced and my dad remarried a stewardess with Air Canada. So I got five free trips everywhere in the world. So I had money and I had this, these trips, which for my kid that came from a, a family where my dad was a phys ed teacher and my mom was a, you know, a home, uh, you know, home sewer, which is, which is another thing that really affected you know, the future of my life. Um, but I got to see the world. I think I became probably the most global person in the world by about the age of 19. And, um, and like I said, my mom was a sewer. So if I want to spend any time with her, it was always in the sewing room, big, lots of fabric, lots of, uh, sewing machines. And, and, uh, I learned a lot about pattern making notches. Um, uh, I guess the whole routine that would go along with that. And, um, and then I kind of, I, I, because I got these five free trips, uh, as long as I was in university, I made sure not to graduate till I was 25. So I kind of figured I was on the eight year bachelor program. And, uh, what were you I, studying? <laughs> well, I started off in, um, uh, biology. I wanted to be an ocean marine biologist and go to Scripps in San Diego, but soon realized I didn't have enough money to do that. And so, I went, when I went to Alaska, I came back with this money and I figured I better kind of go into business because I figured I didn't know what to do, but I thought I could always do something with my business courses. And after two years there, they, they kicked me out of business because I couldn't pass accounting. I just couldn't get the concepts of it. I'm sure I could teach the course now, but at the time it just, uh, you know, there was nobody in my family to teach me anything about business and, and what all that meant and it just didn't connect. So I went into oil economics and I became a, a, I got a BA in, in, in oil economics, which ended up being phenomenally helpful because I ended up mostly in fabrics that were all petroleum based. And I 
really got to understand how to negotiate with uh, nylon, with nylon, polyester, uh, lycra, et cetera, knowing uh, what the price of oil was. Um, and Chip, before we kind of go on about, you know, your earlier days, you know, you mentioned working for the Alaska oil pipeline. I mean, what were you doing and how did you end up making so much money at such an early age? Well, I think I was always a hard worker, so I was willing to step up and do what probably nobody else was willing to do. Kind of the, the thing is you went up for eight weeks and then they shipped you out for two weeks. But I knew that was an opportunity that was never going to exist again, and it was a cost-plus budgeting process. So um, I worked for a year and a half and just took, uh, I think, two weeks off in that, in that time. Um, basically, I was working... You know, I'd work it out with travel time and everything else. I worked about 18 hours a day, seven days a week. So you got double time over eight hours a day, and then you got triple time on weekends and and then on holidays. It was a union job. And um, I remember my first three days uh, was a long weekend. It could have been, I don't know what the long weekend was in, in May in the, in the States at that time, but I think I made... In three days, I made more than I made in my whole summer working as a as a in the parks department in the in the city of Calgary. <laughs> they had me like think about man, this is uh, this is a good place to be. And I I think I you know I didn't I I you know did a few drugs at that time you know, but I wasn't a drinker and I wasn't a gambler and I saved my money and uh, and I came out and I bought a house and I think that. In you know Western Canada, U.S., I mean, housing prices went up, so I was always able to borrow on that as I kind of tried new businesses. So that was a, a, a you know another great thing that happened to me just by chance. You mentioned um, as a kid, like you were sort of like that C student, you know, the the one that's probably more so into sports than studying in class and that kind of stuff. So were you like, was it because you just sort of weren't into any of the subject matters or was there another reason why you didn't, you don't think you were into school as a kid? No, I think it probably, if I hadn't accelerated, I would have probably had a lot more confidence in myself and would have, and probably would have uh, excelled at school. Um, I think being put back, I always felt like I just couldn't keep up. And I think uh, I was a really big kid. Yeah, I was uh probably a head taller than most kids. So even though I accelerated, I was also, uh, um, I was seen as kind of the older guy in the class from my size, but mentally and socially, I was quite a bit behind. Everyone's got an excuse, you know, like all these things that are challenges end up being great things in my life. I think one of the things that came out of that was, you know, after a while, people kind of saw me as big and dumb. And at, at the time, it was interesting because if you looked at comic strips, uh, anything coming out of Bugs Bunny, um, that type of thing, or even in, in general comedy on TV, it was always the dumb blonde, the good-looking dumb blonde, and the big jock. And these were kind of commonly known as stupid people, which was great because what ended up happening is I ended up playing the dumb guy, and just and people didn't realize I was listening in and learning. And, um, but again, what get, got me to where I was, wasn't going to get me to where I was going. So I knew at the age of about 30, 32, that that was the time I needed to change. And, and, uh, and, and in fact, I, um, I stopped playing that, that role anymore. So Chip, I'm curious, you know, you talk about being this global traveler and, uh, having made a pretty damn good amount of money by the time you're 19 years old. You know, what did you do in between 19 and, you know, Lululemon and all the other stuff that you're involved in? I know that you, you know, were in the surfboard type of space. Is that something that you did immediately after, um, after you were, you know, back in Canada or what, what happened? Well, um, I kind of forgot one thing that I kind of put in there before that. When I was um, working on the pipeline, I had this like job, of, which was mind numbing of just making sure like this one part didn't freeze in the middle of winter time. And so I, I started reading. So I read the top 100 books of all time. So did I had no other choice, but to do it uh, because there was really nothing else to do. And so I think that that propelled me also. So from global traveling to having money to being probably having being the best read 19 year old in the world also really helped me out 
again, just circumstances brought me there. <clears throat> when I graduated from university at 25, I did two things. I started West Beach, which was the uh, surf business that I started to kind of bring that, that what people would say was the California look to, to Canada. But in, interestingly enough, it was really the Australians, Quicksilver and Billabong that had come into uh, California. And people kind of adopted that as the kind of like surf, uh, California surf look. And so I brought that to Canada and did so well with it that, and because I had no competition at all, and Canada's about the same population as California, that I then took that to uh, Europe. I was the first one to take surfing to the ISPO show in Munich, which is the biggest sporting goods show, and then, and then off to Japan after that. But at the same time, of course, I was using up a lot of money and I was using my money to learn. I wasn't really using it to make money. I'd always had the goal from thinking about being in Alaska and looking at all these laborers and these older men that were, you know, tied to this job that they hated and drinking and divorce and everything else. And I decided that every move I was going to make was going to be like, when I'm 50 years old, everything's going to be perfect. So I have enough money to handle an economic downturn or a medical issue or anything that could possibly happen to me. So I, um, so at the same time I was doing um, um, the surf business, I was also then had cash flow from uh, being an oil economist at a, an oil company in Canada, which was a f another phenomenal thing that happened to me because it was the biggest oil company in Canada and it was being built on a, on a house of cards from the price of oil kept going up. And as the price of oil kept going up, the company kept buying more more other oil companies based on the price of oil. And then when the price of oil dropped, then it couldn't sustain the debt and it went into basically it went into bankruptcy, the largest bankruptcy in Canada. And what I say was great about that is I got to see a company go straight up and I got to live in a company going straight down over a five year period. But I always had a goal from working on the pipeline that by the age of 30, I'd be in my own business. So I started Dome Petroleum when I was April 25th, when I was uh, 25 years old, and I quit April 25th when I was 30 years old. So there I was, I was in my business. And, oh, and yeah. did you think like, you know, when you started your own business, it would be related to oil and oil economics? Or were you like thinking of something completely different? Because like, it sounds like that was kind of your career path, like you were sort of that's what you'd studied. That's what you had gotten experience in. Were you? Did you still want to stay in that sort of lane? No, I had. I had no idea the two would end up connecting in any kind of way whatsoever. But I think being in economics, it's the art of business, and you, and it's more of a fluidity type of thing. But it, what I did learn was, you know, economies of scale in, in production. I'd say was was uh, how that worked, what minimums and maximums are. And you've got like 40 different inputs and there's no point in having a lot of one thing if you don't have enough of the other, that the, the bottleneck is always the issue. And I think that the, you know, my number one business book at the time, I'd read uh, um, Atlas Shrugged by Anne Ran, and just thinking about how beautiful it is to make a beautiful product and treat people really well and to build a, to build a, a, a business, which um, something I something I could be proud of. Chip, what I'm really interested in is the fact that at this such at such a young age, you had such an incredible work ethic, and you were, you know, just focused on learning and learning and learning, right? Whether it was at work or whether it was reading books, you know. I guess here I want you to kind of transition into more of the advice giving, Chip Wilson. And, you know, to speaking to the, you know, the listeners now, what are some of the things that, you know, early on in someone's career, people should be focused on uh, to ensure long-term success, whether that's, you know, you want to be an entrepreneur, whether that's you want to climb the corporate ladder, whether you want to go into public service, whatever it is, what are some of the things that you should focus on early on in your career? Well, I don't think you can start off soon enough in your own business for one. I think, uh, even myself, I think I could have started off earlier, uh, but there's that fear of not knowing. Well, the, the thing is, you never know at all. Um, I would say one of the, the things that worked for me was just starting. And then when I didn't know, because there was so much I didn't know about business, 
It was I got into partnership about five years after I started West Beach. And so I was a designer, manufacturer, marketing, branding guy. And then I ended up with two guys. One was, you know, head of sales and the other one ran the financials of the back office. And um, even though we, you know, the business never really did that well. We spent 18 years. I call it my 18 year MBA. Um, yeah, I learned from them about how how to run those two parts of the business, how to be a people person in sales and and you know what accounts receivable are, what what net terms are, how to what financials are, balance sheet, all those things that I would have flunked out in in accounting in university. Um, so that what I'm really getting at is there's a period of exponential learning about what business is and all the different parts of it. And then, and then and what I'm saying from that, then there's a time to go, okay, this, to sell that, to sell that and then start all over again. Because I, if I look back at it, the number of things that would get set up in a business that are legacy processes or ways of thinking, <clears throat> um, really get in the way of a company exponentially growing. So, you know, like if you look at, you know, the Nordic countries with Nokia as a cell phone because they didn't have cable, they could go, they could go right to, <clears throat> um, right past cable. If you look at Japan, Korea, or Taiwan after World War, or even Germany after World War II, they had nothing. And then everything they were able to do, they were able to leapfrog. So I think there's an important part to like, saying, when am I going to get out of, of something I'm doing? What have I learned? How can I start something new, fresh, and um, and leave the legacy bits that are kind of dragging, you know, it's like an anchor on a boat in a wind. It's, you need to lift that up and, and fly. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it yet, but I know your mother was a seamstress. Um, did you, growing up, did you, like, have a any sort of passion for like clothing and apparel or was it something that you were just exposed to that was sort of part of your life, but you didn't think that it would be more than that? I, I think I had to have some kind of genetic makeup to like that. Um, I often think back, well, I didn't have any money. So maybe, you know, all the, the you know, the wealthy kids, you know, were wearing cool clothing and maybe they were getting the girls. And of course, as I was saying, I was socially immature because because of my age and my grade and, you know, you start to look for other reasons. You know, I think the natural thing in a human being is that if things aren't working, I start to look for things outside of myself. It couldn't possibly be me. So it must be the way I'm dressing. So I think there was a little bit there. Um, I, th I think it's from being a competitive swimmer and then seeing you know, swimsuits were solid color and then stripes came in and everyone got excited about it. And then I could also see that um, if you were a really good swimmer and you're on the side of the pool, whatever you were wearing, other kids looked up to, to you and saw what you were wearing and tried to emulate. And, um, and so I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, when, when, when flowered speedos came in, I, you know, I, my mom and I started importing them from the U S and I learned about duties and taxes and, um, and markup and selling and trying to get some of those suits for myself because, you know, I was so driven to have that swimsuit. And so in the background there, I think there, there always must've been something that I had an eye for what made apparel work. And, and you rent, west beach for 18 years and that's i mean that's a long time that's more than i've seen most businesses these days run on their own independently before they sell or get acquired or you know ipo or whatever the case may be what was one of the biggest takeaways that you learned from west beach that led into what eventually became lululemon well my big mistake was happened right off the bat i made a bunch of you know, really the first pair of long baggy shorts. And for context for people before that, if you look at movies from the 70s, you know, people wore really tight short shorts. So I developed a, pro uh, a, a product nobody had. I made about, I don't know, three, five, 300, 500 of them. And I went around to like the major department stores and tried to sell them. And they would have nothing to do with them. So I have my first inventory problem, my first cash flow problem. And the only way I can solve it is thinking I'm going to open up my own store. 
So I opened up first, a, you know, for two years, a, um, a booth, I guess, in the outdoor mall in Calgary and started making $1,000 a day. And then after that, then I moved into my own store. But what I didn't realize I had done is I'd really invented vertical retailing. I, 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 was, I was designing and manufacturing and going right to the customer. And so there was no middleman of the store. And, of course, the analogy today is just somebody opening up a, an e-commerce site and not selling, not having the overhead of selling, um, of, of, of opening up a bricks and mortar store with wages and rent and, and all that type of thing. So, so to me, the business looked really, really easy, and I didn't know why. And, but then my mistake of it is that to get to economy of scale production, everyone said, well, you've got a wholesale and I didn't understand markups and all that and how that works. So um, in, in wholesaling, if you make something for 10, then you wholesale it for 20, and then the retail store sells it for 40. Well, well, so now I was like, to get to economy of scale, I was selling a bunch of wholesale stuff through other people at, at, the, uh, at $20, but I'm only making $10 there. Where out of my two retail stores, I'm making 40. But I end up, you know, going global with the retail business. And at the end of 18 years, I was making a, I was losing a million dollars on this wholesale business. And I was making a million dollars a year after these off these two retail stores. So my number one learning is how can I get rid of the middleman in every possible um, way that I can. So even to that extent in Lou Lemon, then I ended up owning my own manufacturing, which I owned at West Beach. I just, it just seemed so incredibly easy to me. And I, but it was all because I was too dumb to know the legacy ways of running the business. Yeah. So, um, like Posh mentioned, you ended up selling the business in uh, West Beach in 1997, I think. And then 98 was when Lulu, you started Lululemon, which was like pretty much right after. So, was the idea for Lululemon something that was sort of brewing in your head as West Beach was coming to a close, or, or was it something that you sort of, finished off with West Beach, and then you went out into the world and it was time to find a new idea. Well, after taxes and everything, I paid. I made about $800,000 off of West Beach, but I'd paid myself nothing, like $30,000 a year for 18 years. So the return on investment was negligible, but the, but the knowledge was, was unbelievable. So I... Um, I had, I had sold the company to a public company out of Salem, Oregon, which is about a five-hour drive south of Vancouver. And uh, I had to go work there for a year um, as part of the deal. Um, I did that. And one of the things I did is, again, I said, well, I'm going to listen to the top 100 business books, self-help books, all that type of thing. So I went through another kind of revolution in my mind. and um, um, But... I'd also, I had two kids. I had alimony to pay. I was, um, you know, I'd spent 18 years never being at home, never seeing my children. And uh, I decided that's not a life I wanted to live. So I figured I could buy a house in Vancouver. I could put my kids into school. I could buy a car and I could get a job at Starbucks as a barista. And, you know, after all the hours and stress and everything of running the business before, I thought that's what I could do. <clears throat> but then I, you know, I think like three things happened to me in a row and one, and I always do this thing when I see three things quickly, then I jump on it. And even though I don't, I kind of thought I didn't want to, I did. So I saw a rip off of, um, on a telephone post, you know, where you rip off a phone number for a yoga class. And I heard then mm -hmm. that day, I heard two women in a coffee shop talk about a yoga. And then the next morning I saw an article in the newspaper about yoga and I'd never seen anything outside of something called the, the Esalen Institute and Big Sur talk about yoga before. So anyway, I, yeah, tell us, tell ahead. us like uh, around that time, you know, in the, in the mid to late nineties, what was yoga? Like, was it this big thing where people, you would see people doing it a lot or was it like a very tight niche community of people that were sort of practicing, you know, yoga and meditation and, you know, like it was like a thing. Like that, those are the people back then, right? Like those people. Yeah, it was. A, it was a non-existent. I'd say the people that were doing it were the hippies out of the communes of the seventies that were doing it. But I, and there were, 
you know, like little pockets, like a one, one yoga's teacher in New York, maybe one in LA and one in Vancouver. And, you know, like that was about it. It was still in India as a, as a major thing. And, um, just making its way over with Bali Bikram and, uh, Padabi Joyce. And, um, but it was, um, uh, it, and I think it was emerging just after I started Lou Lemon with the Bikrams and they, him as a kind of a, a, a sexy icon figure, but um, that wasn't really the yoga that we saw in Vancouver. It was really, really, gran- everything was very granola and not known. So no, I'd say it was non-existent, but. Did you do it? Did you practice yoga? Well, Yes, I did. I mean, I, I took that sign off the or that little rip off, and I went and did the yoga classes. and And I sat in that that first class. It was myself and six women, and um, you know, I knew the clothing was really bad, and I knew that I had a product from from because I went into the snowboarding business after the skateboard business, and I was making first layer clothing for women, and um, and I made these this this fabric or these tights that were phenomenal and. But I couldn't sell very many through the wholesale system. I only sold 57 worldwide. But these women continued to hound me and with letters and everything else about these pants. And so when I, at one point when I looked at what the women in yoga were wearing, I went, well, I've got a much, much better product than these kind of, because everyone wore really their worst clothing to the gym, their worst clothing, clothing to yoga. It was, and in yoga, the, if it's baggy, then the teacher can't really see the alignment or the position of the body. And um, it's very sweaty because it's held in a very hot room and cotton just didn't work for that because of the, it would just bind. So I knew that. And was there a particular brand that you would like see at the time if you went to a gym or a yoga studio or was it like your raggedy old clothes that were brandless? You just like happen to pick one up somewhere and that's what you're wearing. Well, I think the women that were in it were wearing, um, they're, you know, the worst of worst, you know, there was nothing there, but the teacher I had Fiona Stang was, um, uh, what I'd call a wall street, New York, uh, financial dropout that took on yoga. Um, and she wore Dan skin and Dan skin was, a uh, was a incredible, uh, the, the dance pants, they were made for dancing, but they were also made for girls that were absolutely perfect. And because dance skin really, they cut their fabric really skinny, so it stretched a lot. And if it, if it stretches on a girl that's even like two pounds overweight, then it becomes a light bulb on the butt and it becomes transparent. So that didn't work. And I knew this fabric that I'd made for snowboarding for women solved both those issues. So um, after 30 days of that class, it was me and probably 30 women and two gay men. So... So then I knew, I extrapolated from the growth of the surf, skate, snowboard business into yoga. And I went, this is going to be pretty big. But I didn't really take any action until actually the moment I read in the newspaper that 60% of the graduates at a university were women. This is in 1998. And I knew the world had changed. And I knew from working in Africa with uh, charities that the goal of educating women was so they would have fewer children and wait longer to have children so they could get education under control. So I knew that that at that point that there was going to be a brand new market that had never existed in the world. And that was a 22 to 32 year old single professional, athletic, stylish, well-traveled condo owning woman with um, So um, because, you know, because before that time in 1998, no one in business would invest in a woman because it was assumed to 90% that they were going to leave at the age of 23 and have a family and leave the workforce. So why invest in them? So I really, when I figured all this out, I figured that, man, you can really invest in these women and they're going to be, yeah. and they're going to be phenomenal. And I, I got the cream of the crop because nobody else would hire them and nobody else would invest in them. Right. And you see in like the apparel industry, it's oftentimes a lot of companies get into uh, or start like developing a trend or a, or a new type of clothing that and it's like a little too late because, you know, it's it's after the fact after they've seen it happen. But to see something coming that hasn't been done before, I guess, what was 
what did you see and why did you think that there was going to be this shift from, you know, the baggy kind of old, like, you know, just raggedy clothing to something that was a little bit more um, tighter uh, and more comfortable per se? I don't know. Like, was it something that was a functional thing you saw that it was like a performance functional opportunity or more so design and, and the way it looked or both? Well, you may have to, I'll, I'll try a couple of things here. You may have to go back because this is a really <clears throat> big loaded question, but again, I'm a reader. I read, 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 read. So I, and so one of the things I'm very clear about having, you know, being my age at 65 and having lived through the seventies was there was a time when the pill came and when the pill came, women changed immediately. They had control over their life and, and they could see so much opportunity in it, but the men didn't understand what had happened to them. And they were kind of still looking for their mother when they got married. Um, and so these two people got married and then there, I would call like the, the eighties, um, kind of the decade of the divorces, like divorces just seemed to skyrocket. It's all you read about in the newspaper. And so I think what you had then is you had women go into the workforce because the law mandated it. They had power suits, these big, baggy, ugly things that women were to work. And then, you know, the whole thing, like the, I think the media, <clears throat> which I think was, um, uh, probably control in this com this particular conversation by lesbian women who were never able to, uh, to ex propel in the male world because men assumed they were going to get married and go have children. So they weren't going to do that, but they wanted to excel in career. So they forwarded this conversation about, you know, get, you know, women should be able to, you know, work a full-time job whenever they want. But it didn't, at the time, it wasn't really set out this whole conversation about balance. And I think these women worked, but they had to take care of the house. They were still concerned about their children. And what women gave up was exercise and sleep. And I also think that these power women, I call them, went to work and they emulated their father. And their fathers had three martini lunches and, you know, that type of thing. But these women were also on, the, on a heavy dose of the pill at the time. And I think if you looked at news and the trends that it goes through, through the 90s, uh, early 90s, it was all about breast cancer. And I think it was a result of all these things kind of coming together. So then you have um, the daughters of these power women I call super girls. And they... Um, uh, they rejected the way their mother dressed in this whole power suit thing. But I think part of it was because in cartoons, when these girls were growing up, for the first time you brought in a girl superhero. And the girl superhero was wearing lycra. And I think that uh, inside of this, she was equal with the, with the boys or the men or whoever the male superheroes were. And so... I think they got a different framework, like, oh, I'm not unequal to men. Um, you know, like, I'm equal to men, and I have the power, and I can dress how I want. I think that was kind of embedded in there. And then I think through the, um, uh, the fathers of these divorced supergirls did what the only thing that they knew how to do with them, and that's they coached them baseball, soccer, sports, that type of thing. So I think the – and I think these girls said, I don't want to live the life my mother – live so i'm going to get a great education so you have highly athletic highly uh, educated um women that have no issue around men suddenly growing up in 1998 and i think then this yoga thing happened and yoga was the panacea for for women or for girls because it's we're kind of really talking about 22 to to 29 you know at this time we're the only you know maybe even like a little younger but they, um, it's not like it wasn't like surf skate snowboarding where you had to wait for the right weather or you had to, like, you couldn't do it immediately. It, you couldn't, when the surf's up, the surf's up, when the snow's there, it snow's there. But it takes a long time to get there, change, do all that kind of thing. With yoga, you could do it in the urban centers. These working women could do it. They could get to a class, they could get back into, into their job. And so it was, and because it was mostly 90, 2% female based at the time. Um, I think that 
I had learned something from the surf skate snowboard business, and that was if you have a sport which hits a social, it's which is a socially iconic, then people want to look like that out on the street. So I could foresee where yoga was going to be something where women could want to show that they do yoga out on the street. And I had the first perfect pant to do that with a lot of technology involved in it that would take her a sweat, anti-stink, and that type of thing. And what I learned in the, in really in the being so much in Europe in the, because uh, sports really came out of the West Coast, but I really combined it with European fashion, especially Italian fashion. So when you put those two things together, it was, it was a beautiful look. So I'd done that with men, and now the idea was to do it with women. And um, so I think that's what, with Lou Lemon, when you could put technology and beautiful Italian designs to it, I think it just became a home run. Chip, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, you, if, I ma- if my math was correct, you were 43 at the time, right, in 1998? Yeah, sounds good. So I know investors love asking this question. Why were you a 43-year-old heterosexual male the right person to be building a company for 22 to 32 year old women who were practicing yoga, right? Like I know you have the experience. I know you had the vision, but did you think that, you know, number one, you were the best person, the right person to do it. And later on, did that cause any troubles or any challenges while you were building the company? Yeah, there's a lot in there. I mean, probably being 43 again, there there were no, there were no such thing really as a woman entrepreneur at 43 it didn't exist so there wouldn't have you know woman would have got in my age would have got married and had children and dropped out of the workforce so they wouldn't have had that 18 years of experience that i had at 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 west beach you know that's a big mba section so i think the other thing is when i was competitive swimming i i had um you know 50 percent of the swimmers were were girls, and they were always complaining about the straps on their um, on their swimsuits because they were doing ten thousand meters of practice, and rashing, rashing, rashing was all such an issue. I think also that um, my probably best business experience was my grandparents had owned a furniture store in in San Diego where they'd turn over furniture from the Marines coming in and out and buying and selling and. Um, and my grandpa was kind of the people person. Everyone loved him. He was kind of the deputy mayor of San Diego. But my grandma was a hard-nosed businesswoman. So I had kind of this um, this icon of what my grandmother was. I saw these um, my best friends and these women girls at the time who would have been swimmers with me, again, seeing hard work and results. You know, a couple of them were Olympians. And... And I just listened to them, and maybe I had an ear for complaints about clothing because I could see my mom was a sewer, and I could start to envision in my mind how to solve these issues. Um, I think um, I think where those were probably the big drivers that allowed me to be in a position where a woman couldn't have done it. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about when, when you first started the company. Did you just go straight into designing the pants and getting the product out there? Or did you talk to people? Did you talk to women who are doing yoga and tell them, this is what I'm working on? Would you wear something like this? Um, is this something that you see yourself buying? Like, did you do any of that? Or was it just straight, let me, let me build a product and then they'll come? Um, I, I think it's a combination. When I, I built the product first, uh, because, well, I had already had the product built through the snowboard business, so I knew that. I, I hired a you know a fantastic designer by Amanda Stati, who um, who I asked to um, to you know I could sketch, but I couldn't really. I wasn't a woman for the first time. I was in a business where I really I I couldn't intuitively say what was perfect and what wasn't. What I did have, which I think was a massive um, advantage over every other woman's clothing is I think all other women's clothing was designed by gay men and um, and women and nobody was looking at clothing through a straight male point of view for women and I think that's a, you know it's just like 
my wife can dress me in a way that I can't dress myself. She looks at it in a different in a different form. And I know when I dress how my wife wants me to dress, I get a lot of compliments. You know, where I dress the way I want to dress, it just doesn't turn out as well. So so I think that 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 was massive because there was no such thing as um, a straight uh, designer at the time. And I think because I just grew up with my mother, that was a big advantage. But now, I think you asked me a question that I kind of veered off of the answer. So try me again. The question was, yeah, I mean, you sort of answered it was like, did you build a product first or did you get, you know, some sort of input from your target audience who are like, you know, women who were doing yoga at the time uh, before, you know, you started building the product to know what you were building. But you said you sort of had the design from West Beach and you were iterating on that and putting it out there, which it didn't seem like it was like too big of a change. But one thing you did mention early on was that you built your own manufacturing process. You didn't, sounds like you didn't go overseas to have some offshore manufacturer create this product for you. You did it in-house, which kind of leads to my question was how, you know, once you put this out there, any new product that goes into a market, oftentimes you see these copycats and Me Too's coming in right away saying, all right, we're going to compete. And they go to Japan or China or somewhere and build the product. And now, now you have a competitor. How were you able to maintain such a long time? You know, and I, I know that there were competitors that eventually came into the space, but how were you able to, uh, I guess, avo- avoid that? Well, I, I think it. The, the pants were so expensive that nobody could compete against me going through the whole, wholesale market. In other words, if you were to sell those pants through the wholesale business, it was $130. At Blue Lemon, I could sell them for $90, not having a middleman. So that was a massive part of it. I think I had a fabric which I'd already been working on for probably four or five years, and I knew the only manufacturer in the world that could do it. Um, so someone would have had to have tracked that person down. And then they couldn't, you know, because I had priority rights on it, they wouldn't have been able to get that exact fabric, maybe something close. I think the real key was because I was talking about the woman swimming and the rashing, and even Nike at that time was a shoe company and had no idea how to do apparel, and it wasn't thinking from an athlete's point of view. So if you looked at Nike and Adidas stuff, I mean, it was really like, clothing was a pain in the butt for them and they didn't really like it at all. But all, like all the seams, if you look on the inside seams of a pant or even like a running short, you can tell a good manufacturer from a bad one because they'll have open seams. So I knew, I'd heard about this uh, machine in Japan called a flat seamer. So what happens is it puts two pieces of fabric together and it, makes it completely flat and at the same time it cuts out any excess fabric on the inside so it totally stops all rashing and it gave the seaming an absolute beautiful look so for the first time i like if you looked at before that all clothing had seams underneath the arms and underneath the um on the side of the body or in between the legs and yeah all seams were hidden because they were so ugly for the first time i could take these seams and only i could I could, they were totally comfortable. And now I could bring them out and use them as a design feature to make a woman's body look more beautiful. So I could make the, this, the line so her breasts look larger, her waist looks uh, slimmer, her hips look slimmer. And um, again, I got all those ideas from just watching, a t- you know, when I was doing West Beach, I had two, three Italian couture design women who were doing all my production for me. And I learned so much from them about how to how to put aesthetics to a functional product. Chip, why did you call the company Lululemon? When I was at uh, West Beach, I had a um, I, I was in skateboarding, but I was moving to snowboarding really quickly and snowboarding was was trajectory was straight up and skateboarding was getting flat, but I bought a co- company called Homeless, Homeless Skateboards. And I and I produced a line for, you know, it went to Japan and Europe and Canada. I was doing well. I did it for two or three years. And then I went to register the brand. And I recognized I couldn't register it because HOM in French is male. And there were like hundreds of names with, with HOM. So I didn't. I knew I couldn't own the name. 
And then because snowboarding was just like rocketing, I decided I was just going to shut skateboarding down altogether and focus on where I could make money. So, um, but the Japanese are the type where if you give them something for three years and they build a super cool North American brand around it and you don't give it to them anymore, it becomes even more valuable. So I didn't know this. So that year anyway, I, I told the Japanese, said, I said, I'm not doing homeless anymore. We're focusing on snowboarding and, and that's that. And later that year, they came back and went, ah, Mr. Chipsen, uh, we want to buy name homeless from you. Oh, no. And they went, no, no, I'm not. You know, you can't do that. I'm not selling it. I'm, you know, I don't, you know, I knew in my mind I didn't own it or anything. And that went away. But the same thing happened the year after they went. Oh, Mr. Chipsan, we want to buy name homeless from you. And I went, okay, well, I don't own it. I'm not using it. And I really need money badly. So I gave them a price I thought was absolutely ridiculous. And they went, hmm, okay. And, of course, this is at the time when the Japanese yen was at its high. They were buying Pebble Beach, the Empire State Building, everything else in the United States. And money was no object. And um, But I thought, man, that was the easiest money I ever made in my life. And I started to think over the next couple of years about, you know, why it is they like the name so much. And <clears throat> at the time, the, the Japanese way of making money for the big five trading companies was to make uh, apparel brands and then give them an American name to them. But I knew because of the, I thought because the name homeless had an L in it, which the L word letter does, or the pronunciation of L doesn't belong in the Japanese language that a Japanese company wouldn't come up with a name with an L in it. So I thought maybe the kids who were buying homeless thought of it as more authentic North American because it had an L in it. So I thought to myself, geez, if I ever have another company again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put three L's in the name and see if I can get three times as much. It was kind of a a joke. So, uh, (laughs) Okay, so uh, we could do like a little bit of a rapid fire thing for these next few questions if, if okay. you want. Um, first one was this term at leisure, right? This is something that we we saw more so in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years that has become a trend, maybe even sooner, uh, has become a trend. And Lululemon was, was obviously um, the company and, and the brand that started that. So tell us, uh, I, I'm curious, like your thoughts on the word. Is it something that you like? Is it something that you think properly encapsulates what you've built? Or is it something that you um, resent? Yeah, I, I don't like it. It was so. If the history of it is is the way that Lou Lemon was built because uh, I was vertical. I didn't need I didn't need to do trade shows. I didn't need to make samples. I didn't need uh, runway shows. I didn't need advertising because I opened up my own stores. Is that this this whole thing uh, skipped the the New York fashion media? And because it didn't work for the New York fashion media in any way, they couldn't make money off of it. They ignored it. They ignored the the whole movement. And then at some point, I think they had no choice. And, and so they coined it athleisure. And I, again, my statement about that is that's a, that's a, like a, a New York or a New Jersey woman at a mall pushing a cart in pink, you know, velour, you know, with no idea how to be an athlete at all. Just they just wanted to look like it, which is totally the opposite from what I would call the West Coast, which was all about function first and then and then fashion. And then you put the styling in afterwards. So so I, I called it I originally called it in maybe nineteen eighty eight, I called it Streck which was for street technical, but it was a bad word. So it never really got off the, off the thing. But, um, you know, I just moved to street tech probably in the early 90s. And then New York fashion media probably called it athleisure in what, maybe 2014, 215. So they were only 20 years behind the trend, but it just didn't work for them. So um, now, did that answer that question? Trying to be rapid fire. <laughs> <laughs> So, kind of going off, going off of the, you know the whole rapid fire questions here. So you know I think the word cult has a negative connotation for the most part in today's society. Yet a lot of people consider Lululemon and what you built as a cult, as a cult brand with a cult following. Um, what do you think makes it a cult 
and why are there cult followers who follow this brand that you built? Well, I think it was cult, the word cult comes, comes from culture. So it's really the culture that we built. And the culture was built on five uh, foundational um, books and courses. So one was the book Good to Great, which I think is the best business book of all time, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and then The Psychology of Achievement by Brian Tracy. And he spends an hour out of eight hours talking about the psychology of why people do and do not goal set and, and really why people become successful. Another book called The Goal, which was about lean manufacturing. And then the crux of it really came down to the landmark course, which was uh, run by Werner Earhart. And the, and the functions of it, it's a three-day course, which, which at the end of the day really has someone imagine that they can wake up in the morning with amnesia and choose any kind of life they want. So... 99.99% of the people run their future based on experiences of their past, where if you wake up in the hostel of amnesia and you had no idea what your past was and you got to redefine your life and redefine who your parents were and who, to, who your friends were and what people, society expected out of you um, from nothing, then it's almost like seeing Jesus. So, mm. and inside of that then is people get a, a life that they're totally lit up by. And so these people become exceptional in the world and people of mediocrity, mediocrity become scared of people that are living a great life because ultimately we want to live there after survival. The number two instinct is reproduction. So the reason that we always cheer for the underdog and we cut off the, the head of the tall poppy, so to speak, is because the mediocre people want as many people in the middle to, to reproduce with. Because nature doesn't care about us living a great life. It only cares about us surviving long enough to reproduce, and then it could care less. So to really choose to live a great life over the need for reproduction is, a, is, a, um, is something that I'd say most people don't have access to and creates a cult-type feeling. Hmm. Um, after about seven years, I think it was around like 2005, you, you stepped down as CEO, you were still the company, but sort of doing more so like on the innovation branding side, what led to that, um, switch? Like, was it the company, did the company just sort of grow too quickly to the point where you, you, you didn't want to focus on the CEO stuff anymore? Or was there other reasoning behind that? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd made a mistake of listening to people who, uh, who said a couple things when pe people of, uh, Finance keeps saying diversify, diversify. I think the um, the other thing is people kept saying, "Oh, you know, you got a hundred and ten million dollar company you've built in like five or six years. You don't know how to build it. You don't know how to run a billion dollar company." So I got insecure about that. But I'd say the big driver was in that I um, I had missed the lives of my two older children, and I wasn't going to miss the lives of my three younger children. So it was really a um, inside of that was the was the was the like okay I have enough money now to do anything in the world I want and um, what I want to do is I want to live a life of uh, being a good father so that's what was driving that and you stayed with the company a few more years what was it like being involved yet not leading the daily operations so focusing I assume more on the bigger vision the bigger picture. Was it an experience that you enjoyed more than being CEO and running the day-to-day? -day? Um, well, what happens to most people who start off with a product, um, you know, I was, I was a people person, a product person, a brand person, and you're, and you're right. So I, I sell part of the company. I end up with a bunch of millions of dollars, and now suddenly I'm managing money that I don't know how to manage. I knew how to ma run a company, right. but I didn't know how to manage money. Um, I would say, um, what was I going to get out there? I might have to get you to ask the question again because I, I got carried away. Go ahead. Try again. No worries. No worries. So I asked, you know, you were with the company as the chairman and you were still involved even beyond being CEO. Did you enjoy that more than running the day-to-day? -day? Well, what I really needed is I needed a great person to run the company so I could be in the product. 
Um, so I stayed in, I kept my desk in the middle of the product room and I didn't move out of there. And it really wasn't until about um, maybe 2012 or something where, um, you know, the board asked me to, to move out of the product room because, you know, I was kind of like, you know, I was responsible to myself. I knew how to run that business, but it was getting in the way of how the CEO wanted to run her business. And so there was a conflict because I had a lot of power and I was the, I was the, you know, controlling shareholder, so to speak. And so that was, um, that was my big mistake was ever moving out of the floor of the, of the design product area. It was my mistake. It was also the worst thing that happened to Blue Lemon. I wasn't able to do what I was best in the world at doing. And we ended up with a lot of mediocrity for a long time. And I know you've been very vocal about, you know, where the company's gone since you leaving. And I'm curious, you know, if you were to if you were to stay on back then and, and continue as CEO and continue as a leader of the business, what's like the biggest thing that you would have done differently? It's really easy. I really, really messed up on um, when I when I brought in private equity, the, the thing that you have to do right then is you have to know if you ever go public which is almost well private equity people want you to do so they can cash out, is you've got to know how you mm -hmm. can control the board when it goes public. So there's A and B class shares. The owner absolutely has to own the culture and has to, own, has to be able to control the number of people on the board of directors with A and B class shares in order where that never gets lost. So we got taken over by what I'd call financially driven, quarterly driven, financial people that who had no idea how what how to run the company and it's my my analogy is really like even when amazon you know like for years you know analysts would say you know this is the worst company in the world it keeps you know going into debt it won't create a profit like it, the analysts create a profit you know like quarterly numbers quarterly numbers and jeff bezos just basically told them to go take a hike so you've got to if you had, if Bezos had done what the what the financial and, and, and people want Amazon be worth like half a billion, half a trillion dollars today, and everyone would be saying it's the greatest company in the world, right? Nobody would have an un, unbelievable company, but it's not. It's worth a trillion dollars because he knew when to invest and what to invest in, and not listen to the financial people who are just trying to manipulate the stock market so they look good to their investors. So. That is essentially whatever Lou Lemon is worth any time in its future, it'll only be worth half of what it could have because it basically missed the five biggest years in the growth of the, what I, of the street technical market between probably 2013 and 2018. Pat and I have talked to nearly 150 you know, founders and creators, entrepreneurs at this point, and I think a common theme is that these folks always want more. They always want more of themselves. They want more of the people around them. And their driving force isn't necessarily money, right? And I think the same for you. You know, you've reached this status that, you know, is beyond, I assume, even your wildest dreams. And, you know, you could do whatever you want, right? But were you satisfied with, you know, your life after you left Lulam and after you sold, uh, you know, your shares, after you became a billionaire, et cetera, et cetera? Were you satisfied or did you still want more? Um, I was totally satisfied from a family point of view, but to understand what it is to be a designer or a product person, you're never happy. If you're ever happy with whatever you set out to be, there's no, there's nothing to improve upon. And I think um, I had the ideas that flow out of my brain around technical apparel are just so they're infinite. And, um, I say my frustration has come from having to, um, from not being able to fulfill on the possibility that that Lou Lemon was. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I have bought into uh, you know another company and um, our you know our Carex out of Vancouver, Peak Performance of Sweden, and uh, Wilson Balls out of Chicago, um, Atomic out of Austria, and Solomon out of France, and I'm. Um, and I'm, now I have at least a voice in, in like bringing into what I'd say these companies, the, the winning formulas or way of operating and designing and delivering to the marketplace, which 
I think uh, Lou Lemon does a, gr- a good job of, but not a great job of. Talk about Kid and Ace a little bit. I know you're working with your family on that. What's that experience been like? Well, we, um, uh, we had had this idea of doing technical cashmere where you could put cashmere in the washer and dryer. Uh, we, mm. we brought it to Lou Lemon. And um, again, because the financial people didn't want to reinvest in Lou Lemon, they just want to, wanted to milk and harvest the brand. This is back in maybe 2013 or something like that. Then, you know, it was too big an opportunity. And my wife and my son split off to do Kit and Ace. And then the board uh, uh, kicked me off the board because they thought that I, being there, that was a conflict of interest. And even though we had two board members that had a direct competitor to Lou Lemon, which was crazy to me. But I think it's just because I was getting vocal and I thought the board was failing the Louis Lemon shareholders and needed to change, but they didn't see it that way. So, so then I had nothing to do. I'm off the Louis Lemon board. And I, um, and I said, well, I'll get in with my, with my wife and son, but I made, we made a couple of mistakes. And um, one of it, I couldn't, I couldn't be in a small company anymore. Like I'd done the small company thing, you know, like for too long. And so I had a goal of building a billion dollar business in five years, but I soon, I soon learned that I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, build a solid culture in the company in five years. So that was a big mistake. The other mistake was we didn't have time enough to build that one single iconic piece, that T-shirt that would have been best in the world, um, even though I think Kit and Ace has that now. Um, and then the third thing was is that as a family, we didn't have operating principles about how we were governing the business. So we had basically three CEOs with three different um, ways, three different visions, three different ways of leadership, and they didn't work. And we were sending mixed messages to the company, and it was slow. And um, so at, at one point, we saw that, you know, like, we could beat ourselves into the ground and we could make this work over like a five year period, or we could sell the business to the employees and, um, and get out of it. And then recognize that we, we've learned something nobody else in the world knows. And that's how to fail at building a billion dollar apparel business in five years. So (laughs) we have that information, right. And, um, and now I'm actually using that in in a lot of ways, but, uh, that was, that was our in and that was our out. Yeah. And we're obviously living in a crazy, crazy time right now with the yeah. pandemic and everything that's going on in the world. From an entrepreneur's perspective, from someone who's done it, from someone who's been successful at it, what do you see as being the biggest sort of opportunity in the world from a business perspective in the next, in the foreseeable future, 5, 10, 15 years? Well, this, this whole social media thing is so fascinating because <clears throat> even on every level, anyone who's been disenfranchised in the world has a voice now. And everyone wants to be equal with anybody else, but we're not equal. We as human beings are not equal. I can assure you, I'm not going to be a black guy playing in the NBA as a guard. It's never going to happen. Uh, You look at the top, you know, um, eight runners in the Olympics for the 100 meters, you'll be lucky to find a white guy in there. It's just something that those black people have that's just like amazing. You know, you look at music and art and R&D, I mean, nobody can beat them. But, you know, maybe you go to Boston and you look at private equity and you look at all those Irish guys just seem to dominate it. I don't know. What is it about Irish guys in Boston that dominate private equity? I think that they... They like to drink. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, I'm saying that that this is, uh, you know, you look at, you know... um, you know, different, you know, different worlds of women, they, they dominate that. It's, there's no, what I'm getting, really getting at is that people seem to forget that every time they do a click on the computer, they're being targeted and they're being put into a group. Everybody, every action they make. And so there is no such thing as like, I think like total diversity. And, um, you know, I didn't want a I didn't want a board of directors at Lou Lemon that were men because I because I was building a woman's company. I wanted women there. I wanted women executives because I wanted women that understood who our customer was. I didn't want a bunch of men. 
You know, so is there, I think about if I, like if I'm, if I'm going online and I want to like um, look at reggae clothing out of Jamaica, do I want to see a bunch of uh, Irish guys there selling that? No, I don't. If I, if I look at a Swedish clothing line, do I want to go there and maybe see black models? Not really. I want to see Swedish. If I want to see hip hop out of like Brooklyn, New York, what do I want to, you know, so all, everything we do and buy is already segmented. And yet we, we can't say on one hand, like things are, we, we got to have total diversity, but on the other hand, know that everything and every product we do is, is already targeted towards my particular way of thinking of bringing everything else. Now, I agree with the whole thing. I mean, we, we you can't, you can't be prejudiced against people in any kind of way. Like in no way can you be. And I think, I think, you know, employment and all that, I mean, there's just no excuse for it. But the problem is, even as myself, we go back to original, you know, the original thing when I was a big dumb kid in school, I mean, I had, you know, I was told I was dumb and, you know, I was like, targeted in that kind of way. I mean, okay, great. I'm an old, rich, big, white guy now, and nobody, and, you know, I'm the target for everybody. But I'm saying I understand. But what happens when you're in a, you're 30 years old, you're in a job, and you get fired? Do you look at yourself and go, what did I do wrong? Why wasn't the right person for the job? What is it about me? You know, the natural human instinct is to look outside of ourselves and blame anybody but ourselves for what's occurring. And I, and even though I agree with, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter and women and equality and everything, we're in 1998, the woman that worked for Lou Lemon all decided that they were already equal with men. So at what point does a group of people with through social media um, use uh, kind of a unionization in social media to, to garner more for themselves um, just because they're a group as opposed to like standing up and going, we're going to do it for ourselves. And I think that, um, you know, I think that somebody has to get in on the, oh God, I could go on this forever. But I think, <laughs> I think the best people are those that take responsibility for where they are in their life, don't look externally for why they're not successful and figure out what they can do about it. Yeah, and with all that said, on that point, you know, what's what's one piece of advice, um, you know, knowing everything you know now that you would give to someone who is perhaps younger or even older who's start, who's trying to start a business right now? They see an opportunity and they they want to go all in. What's something that you could tell them? I tell them even when someone wants to come and talk to me, I can hardly talk to young people, even though I I, I want to mentor all the time. But in order to bring the the level of conversation to something where it can be where I can exponentially help them. I tell them to, to do exactly what I said, read good to great, seven habits of highly effective people, psychology of achievement, do their goals, and then take the landmark form and, um, um, and then tell me where they want to be and <clears throat> what's, their, what's their vision for themselves 10 years from now and then set goals for 10 years, five years, and one year. And then come back, and then we can have a conversation where we can really move your life forward. Chip, one thing I love about you know how you built Lula, man. You know, almost the premise of it is similar to like you know McDonald's saying that they're a real estate company that just happens to sell burgers and fries, or you know Danny Meyer and you know Union Square Hospitality Group talking about how they're a hospitality business, but they just happen to sell food. And you know, you talk about Lula, man, as a people development company uh, that just so happened to sell you know clothing. Um, why did you position Lululemon in that way as opposed to just coming out front and being like, we're an apparel company that sells clothing for people that do yoga and all other types of exercise, right? Why go the route of, you know, messaging and saying we're a people development company? Well, I think my, when my dad was a teacher, so I think I, I, I garnered a lot of that and where I get a lot of, uh, my thrill from, mentoring and teaching people. Um, I think that um, I recognized how slow businesses 
worked without setting the foundation of who are the right people to be working in the company. And I believe that um, that setting up a um, what I think it was because I wanted a company I could go into it and love being at every day. And because you spend eight, ten hours a day there, it didn't make it wasn't worth getting money if I couldn't like enjoy every second of my life. So I think I was determined to be around great people. So if I'm going to be around great people and I need to take responsibility for that, then I set up the program to have people not be mediocre, but to be great in life. I have one more question. And it's something that I'm curious to ask the ultra successful founders is, you know, having built such a massive business um, and, you know, having that level of wealth and that influence and all that kind of stuff, knowing all of this, would you do it all again? There is nothing I wouldn't do it all again. And there's not even regrets that I have. Um, there's things I would have liked to have done different, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, in the end of the day, even the mistakes I made going public uh, and not controlling shares and everything, one of the reasons I did all that was to learn. And it was part of my lifelong learning process. Because I know that it's not really up to me as much as uh, or what, what it is for me, but I wanted to learn so I could pass that information on to my children. And maybe my children, because they have made mistakes, can then go on to live an exponential life. Love that. Love that. Well, Chip, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much for being on the show and uh, hanging out with us and sharing your story and answering all the questions. I think a, a lot uh, a lot of great things came out of it. And I know the folks who are listening uh, will get a lot out of it, too. So uh, wishing you uh, continued health and success. And hopefully we can meet in person someday. But this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank you.